Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about visual regression testing. Um, my name is Christian. Uh, you find me on Twitter at the moment. I work for a company called Source Labs. Um, we are based in San Francisco. And um, yeah, I usually also do a bunch of uh, open source stuff, uh, which are mainly focused on front end automation testing. Um, yeah, first question uh, Who has heard about visual regression testing before? Okay, some hands. Cool. Well, in the world of software testing, we have like a bunch of methods to make sure that our software works as we expect. And in terms of regression testing, um, it is like a type of software testing that seeks to uncover um, software bugs or regression in existing functional or non-functional areas of a system after changes such as enhancements or patches. Um, yeah, what that mean? Uh, what visual regression testing mean is that you have a set of uh, screenshots and you start developing your uh, web app or yeah, your um, app. And after a while, you rerun your, your test again and check if uh, your app still looks like uh, you expect. Um, <clears throat> but if you look back uh, to the today modern web stack, we have an infrastructure, uh, something like Nginx or MySQL, could be Apache. On top of that, we have backend. They can use Python, Node.js, or whatever. And then we have uh, code running in the browser. Um, on the front-end side, you can use Angular uh, for that, or Ember. Um, and finally, the UI, which is the top layer, which, are, which, is, made, uh, uh, for, uh, which is made with uh, HTML5 or HTML and CSS. So and if we want to make sure that our web app is working, um, we need to test each layer. Like we can leave out the infrastructure because uh, these uh, these tools are already tested and have a good coverage, but we need to test uh, our backend and our frontend, and uh, we can do this by unit testing. And we have to make sure that all layers work together by uh, doing some integration tests. Uh, you can use uh, the landing for that, of course. But if you look closely, like there's a part missing there, and this is um, the UI test. Uh, today we don't have like any tools really to make sure that our UI is working uh, as expected. So we want to close this gap today. The first techniques you can use are like to prevent unintended changes are like static code checks, like CSS lint, uh, which makes sure that uh, your CSS code is valid. Um, also, you can use style guides. There are two style, types of style guides. You can have an in-house style guide that um, yeah, says to employees that how, you, how they have to write uh, CSS code. And you can have project, like specific project style guides um, where you define UIs with a specific structure. And um, yeah, it's like a contract how you build UI elements on your website. <coughs> but, Usually we don't live in a perfect world and we can't, we can't uh, afford style guides and um, uh, these things. So let's get back, back to our um, basic problem. Let's imagine we have a website. And this website is made out of 15 sub-pages. A uh, really simple website. And we have to make sure that this website looks good on all four major browsers. Uh, in several um, operation systems like uh, tablet and phone. So before we deploy our website, we actually have to make sure that our website looks good in on 15 pages. Oh, sorry, on 15 pages, four browsers and three operation systems. So if you calculate that, you see that you have to check actually 180 pages to make sure, okay, this website looks good, and you have to like scroll down and have, have to see uh, what's going on there. And this is really a tedious thing. Nobody wants to do this. So we have to automate this process. Um, automation is key here, and uh, the good thing is that today we have tools for that. We can today automate everything. We have to make our process from continuous delivery to continuous deployment. So two years ago, I think, uh, there was a guy called um, uh, James Coyle. He works for Huddle in London. And he created a project called Phantom CSS, which was the first project that allows developers to 
go on a website, uh, take screenshots, and um, after a while, go back to this website, take screenshots again, and uh, compare these screenshots with each other. Um, this tool was really great. Um, it was the first kind, like a unique thing. Um, and the workflow was as follows. You first generate your baseline. Your baseline are the screenshots, like, yeah, the baseline are the first screenshots you take of your website. And then you develop for a while, and before deployment, you run your regression test. And this regression test could have two outcomes. It could pass, that means that all taken screenshots looks the same like the previous take months. That would be great, we, can automate, we could automatically deploy our website. But it also could uh, happen that um, the test failed, and that would mean we have to go back, develop, uh, fix these UI bugs, or probably have to update our baseline if these changes are intended. So, as I mentioned, uh, I'm working on several um, open source projects on GitHub, and one of them is Web.io, which is a Node client to do simple Selenium tests with, um, in Node. And um, I fiddled around with the Phantom CSS thing, and it was pretty great, but there are several features missing which are, I think, really important. One important, yeah, this is a GitHub page. One important one is that when you use Phantom CSS, you can only run your tests in the Phantom JS browser. And the Phantom JS browser is not really a Firefox or an Internet Explorer, it's a WebKit um, version which runs in your uh, terminal. So if you want to do really good uh, regression tests, you need to run it in all kinds of major browsers, and also on um, mobile devices, of course. The mobile device thing is actually not stable right now in WebDriver CSS, uh, but we come to this point where we can also test uh, on native mobile devices, which would be really great. Yeah, let me show you a little demo how to, how we gonna do this. So I prepared this little demo script. I think the font size is big enough. So there you can see that we have uh, we require our WebDriver O or and WebDriver CSS uh, mm -hmm. library. And then we initialize our client by saying, okay, I want to use the Chrome, uh, the Chrome browser. And then we initialize WebDriver CSS by passing the client instance to the init method. And this init method enhances the client uh, object with the necessary WebDriver CSS command. And then we, ju just, do, then we just initialize the Selenium session, open the URL in the browser, and uh, call the WebDriver CSS command, which basically takes just uh, the name of your website and a bunch of elements you want to have a look at, uh, you want to take a look on. In this case, it is uh, the team section and the contact form. I prepared a little demo page. It's just a bootstrap theme. And on this page, I want to check this section and our contact form no, here. I want to make screenshots of these areas and want to compare them uh, after a while to make sure that everything looks good. So if we run this test, note. the browser will show up, will open the website, and you see that WebDriver CSS scrolls through the page and takes the screenshots um, after a while. That's a re the reason for that is that um, the uh, so screenshot command in, web, uh, in Selenium is um, implemented differently. When you use, for instance, uh, Firefox, it will automatically take the screenshot of the whole website, whereas on Chrome, with the Chrome driver, it just takes the website of the current view board. So WebDriver CSS makes sure that you always get the screenshot of your whole website. So since this is the first test we run, uh, we see that um, <coughs> We have no mismatch percenters, that means that everything looks good. And let's take a look on our folder. We, WebDriver CSS automatically creates a folder, and you fi will find three images uh, in there. One image will be the website, and then the other two images will be the desired, um, the desired um, areas you want to test. Okay. This was not meant to be. Um, yeah, um, I was a little bit ahead. 
right now. Um, for this image, um, <clears throat> I excluded the member photos and I uh, I hided the um, wait a second. I hided the de uh, uh, team details uh, information. These are these ones. These ones. These are the member photos, and these are the um, yeah high information. The reason for that is um, if you have changing content, um, you want to, you don't want to screw up your your uh, visual regression test. Um, to prevent this, you um, can exclude or hide things on your uh, website. By excluding things, it puts a black layer on top of these elements, and by hiding things, it just uh, puts the uh, opacity to, no, uh, to zero. And this is the uh, end result of that. So this looks pretty good, but um, how, we can do, how we can run these regression tests in our continuous integration cycle? So I prepared a test folder here, which uh, contains a functional test. This functional test basically just checks if the title is like I expect. And I have an UI test here which basically takes also the same images. But this time I check if the results are within my mismatch tolerance. And this mismatch tolerance is usually by 0.05%. So also in this test folder, I have my baseline images, which look like this. And I can run this test by calling Mocha, and I can like in my continuous integration process, I can make this test depend, like if this test fails, uh, my deployment also gonna fail. <laughs> and there, with this method, you can like make it dependent from your test one. So after this, it should, because I haven't changed anything, it should pass. All right, perfect. So let's make a change. Let's say, let's say, Let's say Vicky and Kevin get married. Let's say Kevin gets the name of uh, Vicky gets a, Kevin gets the name of Vicky, and let's rerun the test. It should it should fail now because yeah the content changed, and I haven't and I haven't hit uh, hide the content. So this should break the test. Uh, here we go. There we go. So the mismatch percentage, percentage in this case is uh, 0.17%. And this time we get like the baseline still and our regression image. And we get a diff image which shows us where exactly the differences are. So we have now two possibilities. Um, if this is not an intended change, we can just fix uh, we can just fix it, but in this case we say, okay, this change is uh, we, um, intended, and this is now the new baseline. Uh, yes, perfect. All right, so let's say we do a pull request. Uh, married. So, so I check in my changes and also. Um, the new baseline. This has, this has an adventure I'll show you in a minute. Uh, Vicky, whatever, get married. So, let me push us on GitHub. So now I do a pull request. Uh, here we go. So, and, and I say, um, add whatever, someone, please review. And the reviewer can see my change and also uh, the new baseline. So, which is pretty good. Like, you can, you can actually see the visual change and uh, the content change. All right. So, like as I mentioned, you can exclude um, uh, dynamic content on your website. You can hide uh, several things. Um, you can actually like uh, define specific XY variables to really be creative uh, in this case. 
You can also um, have different screen resolutions to emulate, for instance, an iPhone or like a tablet. And what's also great is that you can, um, if you don't want to have your baseline images in your repository, you can just um, sync these images with, a, uh, with another server. You might think that uh, what I told you is, uh, looks good and fine, but there are more things to consider if you do regression testing. You can have things like anti-aliasing. You can have things like um, brightness. Uh, and something which is called subpixel shifting. This looks like this. This can happen even if you run the same test in the same browser again five minutes later. Um, you can you can really um, yeah uh, prevent this. So there's a solution for that. Um, uh, there's also other things like one pixel element positioning and complex more complex dynamic content and moving elements, for instance. But there's a solution for that. Um, I, met, uh, I met a guy called Adam Cerny. He is um, the VP of Research and Development at Apple Tools. And this uh, is a cloud service which um, allows visual regression testing in a whole new level. Um, let me show you some demos. Let's say, let's give, let's show, let's see this example. So we have here on the left side our baseline and our right side the new taken images 24 hours later. And you see how many difficult, different parts on the website um, exist and how, yeah, if you, if you would do a pixel by pixel comparison, you see that everything uh, fails in this test. But they have really smart algorithm to um, differentiate between one pixel shifts or um, yeah, actual content. Let's say we do a strict comparison. It will detect that things are just just moved one pixel, and it's not really visible for the human eye. And uh, it will like not alert you that these things have changed. And really great thing is that you can also high uh, difference uh, differentiate between content and layout. And they have a new algorithm which is called. Um, which is called um, layout uh, matching algorithm. And the layout matching algorithm decompiles the website, let's say that, let's say it in this way, it decompiles the website and um, make, like recreates it and it really detects which areas are text and which areas are images. And therefore it can reconstruct the whole structure of the website. You can see a better example of this here. So if we compare these images, they look actually pretty the same. And they are the same, but actually the mailbox on the right side is two pixels lower than on the left side. It's not visible, visible for the human eye. But um, yeah, the usual regression test would detect uh, this change and would mark it as, as a failure. But this test actually is smart enough, the layout matching algorithm is smart enough to detect this change. Like, there's no element around this, uh, and therefore it is not visible for the human eye. So, instead of like comp uh, using web level CSS, which, yeah, web level CSS uses a um, graphics image to compare these, um, to compare the images with each other. So instead of using this algorithm, you can upload your changes, your images to um, Apple tools, and they have like way smarter algorithms to compare these images, and you get the results back and can like define if your um, yeah if your website looks still the, uh, the same. Yeah, there are multiple tools. Um, you don't have to use web level CSS. Um, there are tools who are based on. Um, Phantom CSS and Slimer. They are tools that are based on uh, Selenium. And also other tools which are more like unit, CSS unit tests, where you can say, okay, uh, does my element have the, the width of 200 pixels or a padding of 5 pixels? I don't know. These are here on the right side. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in these uh, 
things of testing, um, you can check it out. There's a great um, start. Uh, there's a great resource on CSS tests. Um, you can also check out uh, WebDriver.io or WebDriver.css. And um, yeah, go on Uplitudes to check out their uh, site. They have a great uh, service. And yeah, that's about it. Uh, thank you. Any question? Yes. Um, can WebDriver CSS be run in headless mode? Uh, yeah, you can also use Fandom uh, CSS, uh, Fandom JS um, as well. But I have to have the browser installed, so I cannot just upload all of it to Travis and then. Fandom. Well, actually, Travis has uh, Fandom JS installed, so you can you don't have to do anything. Just use uh, Fandom JS as browser, and then it runs also uh, on uh, Travis. But then I will get only one browser. Right. Uh, if you want to test multiple browser, uh, I would encourage you to use a service like Source Labs or Browser Stack, um, and you can like they run in the cloud, and yeah, it's, I think the best way. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for example, for uh, this 108 pages that you mentioned at the beginning, how long would it take to run this local code, for example? Um, yeah, this, this taking the screenshot took takes uh, to be honest a, a lot of time. Um, by testing 10 pages, which have a moderate length, it would probably take like five minutes, seven minutes. It's pretty long, but um, yeah, it's worth it. Like, you can make sure that your, your website looks the same, and um, uh, if you do it manually, you would probably take the same time, but you can spend it on other things. Yes? How often do you do it? What? How often do you test it? Like every single change you make, or kind of once a week, or when you're ready to deploy? Well, it depends. Uh, usually, you can do it uh, once you want to, to deploy your product. Uh, you can run it like every day to make sure uh, how it looks like, but usually before you deploy. Well, yeah, web analysis does use pixel per pixel comparison, which is actually fine. Like, you can increase the mismatch percentage um, to, like, say, 2% to avoid, like, things like anti aliasing. Um, but you probably miss then something else, which is tiny. Um, I, in my experience, I um, had great experience with the um, graphics image uh, comparison tool. But if you, like, have a website uh, like Yahoo, which has really highly dynamic content. Um, I definitely want to, would prefer using Apple tools because yeah, they have way smarter algorithms. Yeah, so WebDriver CSS has more for static pages than. Yeah. Okay. At some point, you have to yeah use um, tools like Apple tools. Yes. With WebDriver CSS, can I um, emulate button clicks and stuff? So let's suppose I have a button that brings up a modal, and I just want to check if my modal is styled correctly. Yeah, um, WebDriver uh, CSS is based on um, WebDriver IO, which is the Selenium driver. And um, if you initialize your WebDriver IO instance with WebDriver CSS, you just get the WebDriver CSS command. But you can also you can all use all the Selenium commands um, if you want. So you can open a model before you do your screenshot. Sure. Yes. So this is the big problem um, that different browsers and operating systems render buttons differently, for example. Um, well, if by running WebDriver CSS locally and using the graphics image um, um, comparison algorithm, you usually should test one browser. Like you have have to have one baseline for one browser, because yeah, browser renders things differently. Uh, using AppD tools, you don't need that. Um, you can they make sure that they don't mark this as, as a failure. Yeah. Is this in some way automated with the naming schema, the multiple browsers, or do I have to um, 
have a test for every single browser, even though the tests do the same thing, just just use different. What what I should usually do is when you, when I run WebVarIO, I run it with an environment variable, mm -hmm. and I can use this variable, um, for instance, like this. So if I run my demo with underscore browser is, uh, uh, equals uh, Firefox, this uh, test runs in Firefox, and mm -hmm. I can run multiple um, commands with different browser. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if there is a, there would be a way to apply some kind of uh, machine learning technique. So, for example, no, this is not an error. Go ahead. So the I mean, in incremental steps, the 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 thing, the the bot, will basically learn to skip over problems, and because they are not, because I am telling the machine that this is not a problem. Go ahead. Okay. Over and over and over, so basically you create some kind of a learning experience for the machine? There's actually nothing like this actually uh, available right now, but it's, it's an interesting approach. Um, but I, yeah, I, web browser like, uh, uses the graphics image comparison tool, and they don't have that implemented. But I'm not sure how you could, you could do it. Uh, yeah, basically, instead of the yes, no, because now it's yes, no. Yeah. Right? You should be some kind of fuzzy logic in the middle, like yes, maybe, <laughs> something like a, mm, I don't know, just brainstorm. But uh, the, the result is already a sentence, right? Uh, yeah, yeah the, the problem is that you have to learn, to learn, because you need to apply the same um, person, it's kind of, I'm brainstorming. No, 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 sure, sure, sure. When, when I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to understand if there is a, a, a way to teach the thing to be better in the future, automatically. Yeah. I think the exclude helps with that too. You can say, okay, just ignore these kind of. Right. Things. If you if you like if you if you test every time fails at this position, you can like put a black layer on top of it uh, to make sure that this test passes in, uh, in the future. But that's not actually a learning process. No, of course not. Yeah. No, no, please. Um, <coughs> what's this made about this content like? Um, this <laughs> Also part of the UI and um, also the check of all kind of handles. Hidden menus? Uh, what kind of something? If I have a side menu on a mobile browser and a page also. Well you can like do the screenshot and then click on the uh, on the button which uh, opens the menu and then you do the screenshot uh, just scan. So You have many baselines, okay. not just one baseline, but right, you can baseline for any test case. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so is it also a, a web service that returns results and that you can automatize, or do you get a daily report just? No, you can you when you run the test uh, instead of comparing internally on your system, it uploads the images. And after your test, you get like the information which algorithm fails and uh, which not.